Okay, good morning. Uh, so today I'm going to give my second of the three tutorial lectures that I was asked to give. Uh, yesterday I spoke about uh, a research problem that arises in the area of Monte Carlo simulation. In particular, I talked about an output analysis problem. Today I'm going to switch gears somewhat. I'm going to talk about another class of problems that uh, I think is a very important research domain within the Markov modeling setting. In particular, developing tools that uh, apply not to the sort of standard plain vanilla Markov chain models that probably many of us have worked with over the years involving Markov chains or Markov processes with stationary transition probabilities, but shifting gears into the world of uh, Markov chains with non-stationary transition probabilities. So you'll see in a moment why I think this area is important and relevant. I'm also going to flavor my talk with some personal commentary a bit uh, later, so you'll get my sense of uh, why I think this problem has been underexplored historically. So outline of the talk is going to be, I'll talk about what non-stationary modeling means in this context, why it's important from an application standpoint. I'll do some comparisons with the world of stationary Markov process modeling. And then I'm going to discuss uh, a set of approximations for non-stationary models that I think are important and uh, relevant. And then uh, talk about some fast numerical solvers for non-stationary Markov process models. And then finish up, hopefully, with a discussion of some simulation algorithms for non-stationary systems. So that's the outline of the talk. So what does non-stationary modeling aspire to deal with? Uh, well, when you look at lots of the systems that people in the uh, service engineering uh, operations area deal with, a lot of these models uh, exhibit in the real world very strong time of day effects, day of week effects. Sometimes they uh, exhibit seasonality effects. It may also be secular trends that are present. For example, it may be that uh, you uh, are producing cars and maybe you're producing electric cars and you believe that uh, demand for electric cars is going to be going up over the next five or years plus over the operational lifetime of the facility that you're trying to operate. And so some, some background secular trend in which the demand for vehicles will be increasing over time. So uh, there are many settings in which you may want to think about building models in which the a uh, conventional Markov model would assume that, let's say, the demand rate or the arrival rate is constant over time, but in this class of models, we would build in some explicit time dependence into the demand rate or the arrival rate. So that's a general goal of this uh, style of model building. Now, on the other hand, as I was just uh, indicating, models with stationary transition probabilities assume that the dynamics are independent of time. You know, constant arrival rate, constant demand distributions, constant abandonment rates. By the way, what does abandonment rate mean? Well, there's a very important class of uh, service operations settings in which, uh, for example, you're operating so-called call center. Uh, call center would be something like uh, the staffing representatives that answer uh, uh, toll-free calls that are aggregated, let's say, at an airline, at a bank, whatever. So people have inquiries. They make these inquiries over the phone. Maybe they make their inquiries over the internet. And people have to answer these inquiries in real time. And uh, what you would see oftentimes is that if people don't get answered in a reasonable amount of time, then people abandon. So people, if you wait more than five minutes and you only have a 10 minute break, you have to get back to work then uh, you're likely to abandon if you haven't been served within five minutes. In other words, you're not going to continue waiting until you get served. That's what's called abandonment in a queuing model. So uh, the, when you have constant arrival rate, constant demand rate, constant abandonment rate, then the, the types of Markov models that you would be invariably led to are models with stationary transition dynamics. So, in particular, uh, any Markov chain with stationary transition tr uh, dynamics, we can always use the solution of a stochastic recursive equation. So we have a dynamical system in which the state Xn is evolving according to a stochastic recursion that depends on the previous state and some new IID noise introduced at time n. 
So any standard Markov chain can always be written as form, and any dynamical system that has this structure is in turn a Markov chain. So these are basically equivalent representations of Markov chains. Now in the world of discrete state space Markov chains, we can characterize the dynamics of the Markov chain through a matrix, through the transition matrix in particular, namely the one-step transition matrix in which the x, y's entry of that matrix is a probability of going from x to y in one time step. So the dynamics are then characterized by that uh, matrix having as many rows and columns as states. So almost all of the theory that you see in the literature, and frankly a lot of the applied work that you see in the literature, concerns stochastic models of exactly this type in which the dynamics are stationary, in which you have a uh, stationary transition matrix uh, describing the dynamics as a function of time. But what I want to talk about are systems in which you do have time of day effects, day of week effects, monthly effects. And these are systems where the stochastic recursive representation of the Markov system has the property that the state of time n is some function potentially depending explicitly on time n of the state at the previous time step and some new independent noise. So all Markov chains with non-stationary transition probabilities can be represented in this form and all recursive uh, dynamical systems of this form can be expressed as non-stationary Markov chains. And what you see in this recursion is that, for example, the state dynamics at time n, the uh, rate of increase in time n could depend explicitly on n, n could be 3 p.m. You'd use different dynamics in evolving from 3 p.m. to 3.05 p.m then in evolving the dynamics, let's say, from 8 a.m. to 8.05 a.m. Imagining in this case that the time increment that's underlying the model is a five minute interval. So in this case, uh, what we end up with is a uh, system in which the transition probabilities now depend explicitly on time, whether n corresponds to 3 p.m. in the afternoon or 8 a.m. in the morning. And now the dynamics of the uh, Markov chain, of the Markov process, are going to be characterized not by a single transition matrix, but by a sequence of transition matrices describing the dynamics as a function of time n. Now, <clears throat> here's an example of how traffic uh, arrives to a typical call center. This is actually data collected from a very large U.S. call center for a bank. What you see here is the uh, number of uh, arrivals per hour. So this is basically described in terms of arrivals per hour. And what you're seeing as a function of time of day is uh, the implicit arrival rate associated with this time of day. And you can see what a strong time of day effect there is in the arrival uh, in the calls to this bank's call city. And uh, you can also see this is a trace for a single day. So what you're seeing here, I think, are two-minute interval counts renormalized to correspond to number of calls per hour. And uh, you can see that the, there's not actually that much stochasticity in the arrivals to the system. But what you do see is a very, very strong time of day effect in the system. So it's fair to say, in this type of system, that the time of day effects, this temporal uh, behavior of the arrival rate as a function of time of day, far dominates the stochastic effects in this system. So if you ignore this and you just build systems models with stationary transition dynamics, you're ignoring all of this temporal structure and you probably are not going to get very accurate predictions of number of callers waiting, of quality of service characteristics, uh, even of probably some of the qualitative behaviors that are present in this type of system. So we want to build models that uh, take uh, these temporal effects into account. Of course, these non-stationary have always been present in the real world. This raises the question of why has there been so little research done to date on this class of models? And Frankly, one big reason for that is that stationary models are just much more easy to analyze mathematically. They're also much easier to interpret from a mathematical standpoint. And 
Simpler models are often sort of more aesthetically pleasing from a mathematical standpoint, from maybe from a st taste standpoint as well. People prefer to maybe work within this class of models. But, uh, how would you do that? So there's a question, a comment, I think a very good comment made about uh, trying to understand sort of the basic underlying stationary dynamics. Of course, this is a situation where you have such strong temporal effects that probably doing that is probably not very representative of the actual dynamics that are present in this system. At least that would be my view. So <clears throat> what you always have in the world of mathematical sciences when you build models is trading off tractability against model fidelity. And uh, when you think about building models that are only going to be used descriptively, maybe primarily in order to get qualitative insight into the system, building a model that isn't necessarily got enough structure built into it to make good quantitative predictions is a completely reasonable mathematical perspective and a mathematical perspective that can add a lot of value from an application standpoint. So if you actually look through, I think many of the most successful applications of stochastic modeling within the OR-based stochastics community, I think what you would see is that indeed, uh, many of the big success stories have been in settings where people are not intending to use the model to actually make quantitative predictions, but are instead thinking about using the model to make uh, stylized uh, predictions about qualitative behavior. So for example, in the world of telecommunications networks, a very standard thing that people have historically done that has, I think, added a lot of insight into design of different communications protocols is looking at a stylized model of a particular communications protocol. For example, identifying the stability region that goes with that particular protocol. Stability region would be the set of arrival rates under which the uh, system will be stable, uh, where <clears throat> the system will be able to handle all of the uh, arrivals, all of the uh, network traffic that's coming into the system. And then Obviously, if you have a second protocol in which the stability region gets significantly expanded from the stability region that you have for the first protocol, in other words, there's a much wider range of rates, arrival rates, uh, that can be uh, adequately handled by a system with the same basic resources, then I think everybody would agree the second design is preferable to the first design. And you'd expect that even if you have non-stationary dynamics in the system, that that's uh, that the good characteristics of the system are going to be inherited by the second system relative to the first system. So that type of qualitative insight, uh, I think, is indeed a way in which communications engineers have used Markov models over the years with great success, and there's a lot of insight that has come out of those stylized predictions about network behavior. So in that context, you know, there's no question of even trying to fit these models to data. There's no question about literally interpreting the uh, numerical results, uh, predictions that come out of these models. You're basically using these models to understand, to, to get qualitative insight into the uh, behavior of different alternative designs. Another setting in which you commonly, uh, I think a lot of qualitative insight has been developed over the years, is looking at different uh, control policies, looking at different optimal controls derived in the context of stationary dynamic systems. Uh, one will uh, see that in a particular stylized environment, a particular type of control policy is optimal. And then that sort of sets the stage for trying to adapt that potentially to the non-stationary environment in the real world. But the stationary model plays an important role in getting an understanding of what class of controls, what class of policies should you be starting from in terms of building a good solution. But I think that we're now moving in the area of mach in the, in the uh, this era of machine learning, this era of big data. Uh, machine learning provides an alternative way of making predictions in a lot of environments. I think most of us that have a preference towards building math models in which the sort of underlying physics of the system can be built in would like to see that our models can also play a role in that world. And if we want to see that our models play a role in that world, then we're going to have to up our game in terms of actually building models where you have some chance of making good quantitative predictions. 
and good quantitative prescriptions from an optimality standpoint. So in a world such as the one that we're moving into, if we want to be competitive with machine learning algorithms and things of that kind using physics-based stochastic models, then we're going to need to have higher fidelity models where we actually can trust the predictions coming out of these systems. And in that world, you can see from that call center example, it's just inevitable that you're going to have to deal with non-stationarities and arrival rates and things of that kind. So it really makes moving into this non-stationary Markov modeling uh, world a sort of a major uh, mathematical and modeling concern. Let me just say now a little bit of comparison with stationary modeling. So in the world of stationary modeling, of course, we know that when you want to compute the n-step transition probabilities, we can do that by just taking the one-step transition matrix and raising it to the nth power. That's a beautiful insight from the world of Markov modeling. And of course, another thing that we know in this context is that uh, there's very nice behavior that we get in equilibrium if you send n to infinity. And typically, under very modest conditions in the finite state world, the n-step transition probabilities will converge to the equilibrium probabilities, uh, where the equilibrium probabilities have a very simple solution. Pi equals pi p is the system of linear equations that you need to solve. And uh, that steady state distribution, or stationary distribution, or equilibrium distribution, plays a fundamental role in lots of mathematical analyses. In fact, I think it's also fair to say that in many, many modeling communities, Basically, computing the equilibrium distribution is almost the whole game from a mathematical standpoint, because even in the stationary case, computing the n-step transition probabilities explicitly is typically hopeless for most standard, for most uh, reasonably interesting or complicated models. There are very few stochastic models for which the n-step transition probabilities are known in closed form. So in particular, <coughs> the Equilibrium distribution in the stationary case is known for birth and death chains, Jackson and Kelly networks, full class of product form queuing networks. And again, computing the equilibrium distribution has sort of been a central focus of stationary Markov modeling over the years. And one of the things that also is important to realize that's sort of implicit in this result, namely the fact that the n-step transition probabilities converge to limiting probabilities that are independent of the initial state, this is really saying that for large values of n, the distribution of where you end up with at time n is independent of the state x that you started off at. And that, of course, is basically a loss of memory characteristic of that dynamical system. So loss of memory is a key property in the world of stationary Markov modeling. Now, in the non-stationary context, it's conceivable that we have a system in which the arrival rate is basically increasing over the course of the day. In this context, uh, it may even be unreasonable to sort of expect that you can even define a steady state for the system. So the notion of equilibrium behavior is typically irrelevant in the non-stationary case, except for one very, very important environment that does come up in many of these applications. In particular, when you have time of day or day of week effects, it's not unreasonable from a practical standpoint to assume that you have periodic behavior in these transition matrices. And then uh, you would end up with a situation where there is, in some sense, an equilibrium to the system, but it's a periodic equilibrium. So for example, if you look at uh, the load on a system between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. on Mondays, and you look at that over a long sequence of different Mondays, over the next 52 Mondays, corresponding to the next year, you'd see that there is an average equilibrium behavior that you see in that context. And so there is a very well-defined notion, a very well-defined sense of having periodic equilibrium behavior in that uh, context. So uh, one important thing to realize is that if you want to actually numerically compute this periodic equilibrium, uh, basically the starting point is computing, for example, the equilibrium behavior, let's say, at midnight on Monday morning. Let's say going from midnight to, let's say, 12.05 a.m. on Monday morning of a typical week. So you want to compute that equilibrium behavior. What do you need to do? You need to solve the equilibrium equations pi zero e to pi zero r, where r is the dynamics over a full seven day week, over 168 hours. And that's going to involve multiplying all the different transition matrices corresponding to the dynamics over each 
time period over that one week. One un very unpleasant thing about doing this calculation is that in order to form the system of equations, we have to multiply out this entire set of matrices. And it's unavoidable that you have to basically do matrix matrix multiplies here. And again, if you think about numerical computation, that's a very bad situation. Generally, you want to avoid that in doing large scale numerics for systems that have many states. In particular, you'd much prefer to do matrix vector multiplies than matrix matrix multiplies. This is a bad situation. I'll come back to that a bit later in talking about numerical algorithms for non-stationary Markov chains. One of the other unpleasant things about this matrix R is that invariably it's going to be extremely non-sparse. Probably the entire matrix is going to be non-zero. <clears throat> All right, so almost everything, nothing in the non-stationary setting is going to be computable. As a result, I'm going to focus on approximations and fast computational algorithms for looking at these systems. Now, there's one notable exception to this, and that is the world of so-called infinite server queues. So infinite server queues are just as tractable in the non-stationary context or the stationary context. In particular, for those of you that have some knowledge of the so-called MG infinity queue, so the MG infinity queue is a queue that's fed by a constant rate Poisson process, and the service times are IID general, so they don't have to be exponential. They can be any old distribution you want. There's a simple closed form in that context for both the transient behavior of that system and the equilibrium behavior of that system. Both of those distributions turn out to be Poisson. And something similar happens in the non-stationary case for the M of T G infinity system. So that means that the arrival rate is now non-constant. You have a Poisson process with uh, non-constant arrival rate. You can even allow the service times to be time of day dependent. Even at that level of generality, again, you have Poisson distributions for the, uh, uh, for the distribution of the system at a given time too. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk now about approximations for non-stationary Markov chains. What is it that you want from an application standpoint? We want approximations that don't rely too heavily on model structure. We want something where the numerical computational effort is going to be comparable to doing stationary style calculations. We want an approximation that's derived from an asymptotic regime that seems reasonable from an application standpoint. And we want something that can be relatively easily implemented. So <clears throat> There are existing approaches for some models for doing this, but they can be very model specific. Another big problem is that a lot of the work that's been done in this area, and there isn't really that much that's been done, but of the work that's been done, it tends to be focused on proving nice theorems, but not necessarily thinking about how do you actually translate the limit theorem back to the pre-limit system that you're actually interested in in the real world. So all these theorems will have an epsilon going to zero, we know if you actually want to apply these things in the real world, you actually have to translate that back to an actual real world system. There is no epsilon in the real world system. How do you make that translation back to the uh, real world system, to back to the pre-limit? That actually can be a bit subtle in this context. Okay, so uh, here's the most obvious approximation that uh, people have used historically, the so-called pointwise stationary approximation goes back a long time. Point-wise stationary approximation says we'll approximate the uh, behavior of the system at time n by basically assuming that whatever transition dynamics be being used at that time uh, are uh, representative of the transition dynamics uh, in some interval around that. And then you assume that uh, the system uh, reaches equilibrium within that neighborhood of times. And as a consequence, we can substitute the equilibrium distribution that goes with the one-step transition matrix associated with time n, and use that as an approximation for the distribution of the system at time n. So translating that into the math, we have our one-step transition matrix Pn at time n. We compute the equilibrium distribution that goes with that, and we use that to approximate, for example, the expected reward uh, associated with the system at time n. Expected reward, of course, is just a surrogate for any old performance measure you might, might want to compute. The R function could be an indicator in which you're computing 
the probability distribution of the Markov chain at time n. So as I just indicated, this is valid when the pj's are essentially constant for j close to n. And let's see why this works. Uh, the correct exact expression for the expected value is we take the initial distribution mu encoded as a row vector, multiply by the one step transition matrix for time step one, time step two up to time step n, and then to the end to integrate over the reward function, we post multiply by the column vector r corresponding of to rewards. And the regime that we're interested in here is a regime where <clears throat> the last m transition matrices are all roughly similar, all quite close to p sub n. So when you look at this matrix product and you look at the last m of these terms in the product, they're all the same matrix n, and you're looking at p n to the mth. We know that we have loss of memory for these, uh, uh, for the for taking when you take a single stochastic matrix and raise it to the nth power, we know that we have loss of memory. So this should be converging element by element to the equilibrium probabilities, at least when m is big. So now we can substitute in the uh, rank one matrix pi sub n, in which the x y entry of this one uh, rank one matrix is just the equilibrium probability of being in state y. And now because this matrix has identical rows, or equivalently, if you look at the columns, you get exactly the same entry coming down every column. If you take any stochastic matrix whatsoever on the left and hit that on the right by such a rank one matrix, well, what's the x, y entry of that rank one of that type of matrix product going to look like? Well, it's going to be the inner product of a row of this, whatever the stochastic matrix is, with a column of this uh, matrix pi sub n. That rank one matrix has exactly the same entry coming down everywhere on that column. So when you do the inner product, that common entry comes out of the sum, and you just get the row sum of the stochastic matrix, which is one. So as a consequence, multiplying any stochastic matrix by this rank one just gives you the rank one matrix back again, which gives you the pointwise stationary approximation. So now what do you want to do? We want to improve upon the pointwise stationary approximation. And a very natural and I think reasonable asymptotic regime is the asymptotic regime in which the, in which the transition probabilities are changing slowly as a function of time. So let's make that assumption. So let's let P sub K, let's imagine that it's embedded in a continuous time process. So P sub K looks like P of KH for some family of P of T's that are continuous in T. In fact, smooth in T. And then we can expand out Pn minus K. We can do a Taylor expansion of Pn minus K around uh, K equals zero. And we get P of NH minus K times H times the derivative of this uh, family of transition matrices evaluated at time NH. Right? So that's a pretty natural first order approximation to try to get a sense of how to improve the pointwise stationary approximation and one that will be well justified in settings in which the transition probabilities are changing slowly. So now you can do something uh, similar to what we just did in the pointwise stationary context. Again, let's take this matrix product. This is the exact representation of the expected value that we want to compute. Take out the last m terms just prior to time m. And then now, rather than just substituting in the pointwise stationary approximation, put in this correction having to do with the uh, with the, the change in the transition matrices over that interval, and collect terms. So collect terms in order h, and we get collect things into this sum. M is going to be big, at least uh, in the approximation that we're going to be thinking about, so we can replace this finite sum with an infinite sum. We pull out this common rank one matrix, and we get this infinite sum down here. <clears throat> now, an uh, important thing to recognize is that when you have parameterized families of transition matrices like this, and we differentiate this uh, sum with respect to T. So what is this sum? This sum is the uh, row sum corresponding to state X in this matrix, and we're basically differentiating that row sum as a function of the parameter T. This derivative is always going to be equal to zero because this row sum for all values of T is equal to one. Derivative of constant is zero, so we end up with this quantity up here, and that means that uh, this uh, matrix pi, P prime of NH has row sums equal to zero, 
rho sums equal to zero, hitting this rank one matrix gives you a zero matrix. So in other words, I'm allowed to take this and subtract off from that the rank one matrix without changing anything. So we end up with this equivalent representation. And now, uh, something that's probably well known to many of you who've worked with Markov chains is that uh, when you take the jth step, the jth the power of a stochastic matrix and subtract off its corresponding rank one limit, uh, this quantity can be re-expressed for general J as P of NH minus P of pi of NH raised to the jth power. So it's just a simple computation. I've illustrated it here in the case of J is equal to two. And that allows us to rewrite this infinite sum as something that looks like this. And now what we have sitting over here is a summation over j equals one to infinity of j times some matrix to the jth power. And that is something that's very nice to work with. In particular, uh, when you take the product of two geometric sums of some power of the matrix A, this is exactly what you get. You basically end up with something that exactly looks like what we have here except that there's an extra j plus one rather than a j sitting up there. So we have to adapt for that by subtracting something off and this is the correct thing to subtract off. So all simple basic stuff. And when you plug in the insights that we've just gone through, what we end up with is this improved approximation to the uh, point y stationary approximation. Now this is just an example of a calculation that you can do in the world of non-stationary Markov process modeling. This is a situation where we're trying to approximate the distribution of the system at time n. But you can do similar things for almost all of the other performance characteristics of the Markov model that people are typically interested in in practice. So in particular, there are many expectations that can be analyzed through first transition analysis. So for example, you may be interested in looking at the infinite horizon uh, discounted payoff from some investment. Maybe that the underlying Markov chain actually has non-stationary dynamics. This type of discounted reward, it's well known, we probably all know, that in the stationary dynamics case, there's a simple system of linear equations that we can derive through first transition analysis for this uh, family of expected values. Well, uh, the same sort of perturbation argument that we just went through for the time and distribution is also something that could be applied in this particular context to get a perturbed approximation to this infinite sum, taking into account the non-stationary uh, dynamics of the Markov chain xj. You can do that also with expected hitting times. All of the different expectations that are amenable to first transition analysis, there will be simple non-stationary corrections that you can make. And the non-stationary corrections will invariably uh, take the form that the correction G that you make to the sort of standard stationary dynamics uh, calculation is going to involve solving a linear system that looks exactly like the linear system that arises in the stationary case. So these linear systems are no harder to solve than the linear systems that come up in the corresponding stationary versions of these models. So for example, if the underlying model that you're dealing with is birth death, in that case, the transition matrix is tri-diagonal. All of the non-zeros in the transition matrix are going to be on the diagonal, super-diagonal, and sub-diagonal. That'll be inherited also by the non-stationary analogs to those types of models. And in particular, when you compute these correction terms, this coefficient system will again be tri-diagonal. In other words, just as tractable as the original stationary dynamics model that you may have started from. So a lot of nice structures there. Now, <clears throat> everything I've just described in the discrete time context generalizes quite straightforwardly to the world of finite state Markov jump processes. Also generalizes in a suitable way to the world of reflected Brownian motion. Reflected Brownian motion is a standard continuous time, continuous state uh, diffusion process that's often used to approximate many of the queuing and congestion models that people deal with in the uh, Markov process world. Now, <clears throat> one thing that does get more complicated when you move into the world of reflected Brownian motion and models like that is that reflected Brownian motion is a model that has infinite state space, not finite state space. And there are new effects that can occur in the world of infinite state space. We know this already from the world of stationary Markov modeling. In particular, when you move from finite state space to infinite state space, you have 
the potential that the Markov model exhibits transients, null recurrence, things like that, that cannot happen for finite state models. And in particular, when you look at infinite state systems, something like reflected grounding motion, you can be dealing with systems that transition in and out of stability. So you can be in a one time of the day where the arrival rate is less than the uh, service rate available to handle incoming customers, and then move from that into a very heavily congested time of day at which the arrival rate is larger than the number of, uh, than the amount of service capacity that you have. And in that second period, you're gonna be overloaded, and then the system is basically going in temporary transients. And the one comment that I wanna make is when you're thinking about trying to develop approximations in that setting, and let's imagine that you have constant service rate, and so the only thing that's fluctuating is the arrival rate into the system, and you go from a time of day in which you're undersaturated to a time of day when uh, you are congested, you don't have enough service capacity up here, so here the queues are building up, or you can handle all of the incoming work. So <clears throat> these types of approximations obviously are approximations that you can only use in regions in which the, uh, the system is exhibiting stability characteristics, because the whole, uh, at least the, the, uh, the approximation that I discussed that built off the point-wise stationary approximation is assuming that you have an equilibrium distribution for the system, so you're building your dynamics around a system that has equilibrium behavior, it's gonna be irrelevant to this region. Now you might ask yourself, okay, it's irrelevant up here, is there some other approximation that you can use up here? And the sort of sad state of affairs is that there really isn't any universally applicable stationary, uh, or uni any universally applicable approximation that you can make or Markov models that move into a, 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 a interval of temporary transients, and the reason is that uh, well, all transient models, or every transient model, is in some sense transient in its own special way, whereas all positive recurrent models are sort of similar in some sense. They're all converging to equilibrium, they all have relatively simple behavior, similar behavior in that qualitative sense. When you look at transients, there are an infinite number of ways that systems can go transient based on their own individual dynamics. So you can never expect to sort of develop model independent approximations for uh, the dynamics of systems in these intervals in which you effectively have transient style behavior. That's gonna have to be developed model by model. Down here, you can have universal principles for doing things, and that's basically what we've discussed in the previous slides. This is no school that you just like that you don't have to try this, but sometimes you still have to do this. So uh, I was implicitly uh, taking a finite state Markov chain and all the analysis that we did earlier. Yeah, so I was doing, dealing with the simplest case. All right, now let me say a little bit about uh, numerical solvers for non-stationary systems. Again, what we're interested in doing is potentially uh, computing this exact expected value. And we know that the exact expected value involves the product of these transition matrices post multiplied by R, pre multiplied by the initial distribution mu. I said earlier that periodic models are a very important class of non-stationary dynamic systems. And one algorithm that you might apply in that context is to basically compute the solution of the forwards equations, which basically means evolving this uh, uh, initial distribution forward in time by multiplying the uh, mu P1 times P2 up to Pj. And of course, this is a, something that can be done very easily recursively in J, and you just continue doing that until you get J up to J equals N. And then when you get up to J equals N, just post multiply by the column vector R. Now you have your solution. And the advantage of this particular algorithm is that you're doing vector matrix multiplies and vectors Vector matrix multiplies, as I said earlier, are always much faster to do in large state space systems than doing matrix matrix multiplies. That's a good thing. So you get a complexity that looks like this. Basically, the S squared is coming in because that's sort of the typical complexity that goes with doing a vector matrix multiply when you have non-sparse systems. 
you have sparsity, and this is basically linear to basically proportional to linear proportional to the number of states, linear in the number of states rather than quadratic. Now the second algorithm is what we sort of hinted at earlier. Another thing that we could do is we could just multiply out the product of P1, P2 up to PP, form the matrix R, uh, and then take the matrix R and begin multiplying that. And that would give us the distribution of the system up to M full periods prior to the time N that we're interested in. Then you just do some vector matrix multiplies at the end to get you out to time n. That's a different style of algorithm. Uh, that algorithm is nice in the sense that we've uh, sped up significantly the uh, computation of the uh, dynamics over full periods by doing this uh, matrix R raised to the nth power. The problem is that we had to compute the matrix R to begin with, and the matrix R, of course, involves having to do matrix matrix multiplies. So there's a trade-off that comes in, and you can see that you get a significantly different complexity for this algorithm. This is a situation where algorithm one is better than algorithm two if you have a very large state space, because you're saving on having to deal with all of the uh, additional inner products that need to be computed when you're doing matrix matrix multiplies. In particular, algorithm one is better than algorithm two if the number of states is significantly larger than the length of the period. Of course, in many applications, the length of the period is actually going to be quite big. Imagine that we are looking at a call center. We really, the right way to model the dynamics in the call center is to think about things in continuous time. We really have an underlying Markov jump process. We can approximate that if we wish by a corresponding discrete time Markov chain model. In order for that model, the discrete time Markov chain model to have good fidelity relative to the continuous time model that we're really interested in, we probably really need to be thinking about evolving that discrete time Markov chain forward over relatively short time intervals, like let's say one minute. So now you're thinking about evolving this discrete time dynamics forward one minute by one minute by one minute over an entire week. There are lots of minutes in one week. So the value of M in that context is gonna be quite big. As a consequence, uh, the M could be quite large in that context, right? So there are settings where the M could really be very, very big. And uh, so both algorithms are potentially relevant in practice. Okay. <clears throat> now, the, the, uh, another potential algorithm that you can do, if we're interested again in, let me go back to the basic problem of interest. So we want to compute this expectation. And the important thing to realize if you want to uh, do matrix vector multiplies uh, and take advantage of recursion is that there are basically two ways of making this, of doing this calculation recursively. One is to first compute mu, then to post multiply by P1, then P2, then P3 up to Pn. And then at the end of the calculation to post multiply by R, that was the approach that we discussed earlier. That's one recursion. We're recursing this product from the left. That's basically the forwards equations, Kolmogorov forwards equations that we're talking about here. But of course, the other approach that we can do is we can start off with R, pre-multiply that by Pn. That's a matrix vector multiply, then Pn minus 1, Pn minus 2, and recurse back from right to left. That's the backwards equation that comes up in the world of uh, the Kolmogorov equations. <clears throat> so, Two different ways, recursing from the left, recursing from the right. So algorithm number three involves recursing from the left, starting off with Pn, then to Pn minus one, Pn minus two, and recursing back in this direction. And the thing that's very nice about the backwards equations is that <clears throat> you can, you have a nice stopping criteria, and you don't necessarily have to recurse all the way back to time zero. In fact, typically you will not need to recurse all the way back to time zero. Because in the world of non-stationary Markov chains, it's also the case that non-stationary Markov models exhibit loss of memory. So in particular, in systems, finite state systems, typically, uh, even if you have non-stationary dynamics, the Markov chain will eventually, if you run enough transitions of that Markov chain, even with the Markov chain using 
different uh, transition matrices from one time step to the next, the system will still lose memory in grade generality, which means that uh, the, this vector uk of x, if we multiply enough of these things together, eventually this uk vector, just remember what this uk is, uk is the expected reward at time n, given at a time k, we're in state x. And loss of memory is going to tell us that uh, the initial state that we're in at time n minus k, when k is large enough, basically becomes insensitive to the initial state, so that these uk values have effectively become identical. And once these things are close, that means that you can stop recursing backwards. You basically lost memory. Anything that happens prior to time n minus k is irrelevant to the dynamics after n minus k. That's an enormously convenient property of the backwards equations relative to the forwards equations. So for the backwards equations, there are ways of stopping early. Now you might ask yourself, what about for the forwards equations? Are there ways of uh, basically stopping the forwards uh, equations early? And uh, there are actually many papers that exist in the world of numerical Markov chain theory in which people have proposed different stopping criteria for the forwards Kolmogorov equations. But unfortunately, at least in my view, the sad reality is there is no theoretically sound way of stopping and terminating the forwards equations early. So let me give you an indication of why that's the case. So in the world of non-stationary modeling, here we are at time zero, here we are at time n. The forwards equations are evolving forwards in time. We want uh, to have information about the distribution of the system at time n. So suppose that I stop the dynamics at time k, so I terminate early at time k. This algorithm hasn't seen any of the transitions from time k to time n. It doesn't know, for example, that there may be a big increase in the arrival rate over this interval. None of that's taken into account in this calculation. So there's no way, since this calculation doesn't know what's coming up, there's no way for this calculation to stop early when you're interested in computing the distribution at time n. And similarly, even in the case that you have, pardon me? You know the first use of the metric Yeah, so you could do that if you knew that the system had lost memory in that interval. So the, you know, you'd have no guarantees if you start at time j and you just recurse arbitrarily forward. If your system hasn't lost memory from time n going back to time j, then you'd have a bad calculation, obviously, in terms of what the actual distribution is at time n. It's a reasonable way to think about setting up an algorithm, but would be one with no theoretical guarantees. So this backwards recursion does come with theoretical guarantees. Now, the other thing is, even in the case that you have, so um, most of the analysis, almost all of the analysis has been done on uh, numerical methods for Markov chains, in the case is, has been developed for the case of stationary transition probabilities. And in that case, uh, when you evolve the forwards equations, forwards in time, what you're basically doing is recursively computing u times p to the k. And the problem is that the forwards equations are evolving things forward for one single initial distribution. It has no information on how the system is mixing relative to other initial states. So again, and you can prove this through simple arguments, you can see that even in the stationary case, there's no way in looking at this vector to reliably be able to stop the calculation and say, I don't need to evolve the system any further forward in time. You can get some indication of what the problem is in this context by thinking about a system <clears throat> so-called nearly irreducible Markov chain. So it's, reducible, it's irreducible, there are some transitions between these two classes of states, maybe of order epsilon, so they're quite small. This Markov chain tends to spend a very long period of time in class one before going to class two, and vice versa. And you start off with an initial distribution that's concentrated on class one, and you evolve that forward in time, 
to a time k where it hasn't yet seen, had any significant uh, influence from these types of transitions. It thinks that the system is basically reaching equilibrium within this class of states. It stops early, but in fact it should have evolved, it evolved uh, longer in time. It would have eventually seen the second class of states that would completely change the uh, behavior of the future values of mu sub n. So algorithms that are based on evolving the forwards equations, forwards in time, there's just no way from a theory standpoint they can ever get guarantees like we have for the backwards equations. <clears throat> okay. So let me close with a quick discussion of uh, use of Monte Carlo simulation in the context of non-stationary models. And let me frame this in the context of uh, something like looking at freeway congestion, maybe congestion in downtown Bangalore, uh, let's say at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. in the evening. So how would you want to do a simulation of that type of system? So we're interested in traffic congestion at 5 p.m., let's say. We want to simulate the vehicle traffic. So how do we initialize this simulation? So most natural thing to do would be to look at an urban scale simulation in which we start with basically the freeway being empty of vehicles, let's say at 4 p.m. or 4.30 p.m., and then begin allowing vehicles to begin entering the freeway, begin seeing the congestion effects. And then there's a question of, well, should I have started the simulation at 4.30 p.m., or do I really need to go back to 4 p.m., see some of the congestion effects that would have occurred between 4 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. that would propagate forward into impacting the behavior of the system also at 5 p.m.? Well, maybe it should have been even earlier. Maybe it should have been at 3.30 p.m. How far back do you have to initialize that type of simulation? So there's a question that's very, very similar to the question in the context of, Markov chains with stationary transition probabilities of how long does it take for the system to reach equilibrium in, a, in, in such a Markov chain? This is the non-stationary analog of that, except in the non-stationary world, the way that you most appropriately think about these types of problems is thinking going backwards in time. And in the world of stationary modeling, when you think about coupling and things like that, you're typically thinking about going forwards in time. So, just a different way of, uh, of, a, of mathematically uh, describing, yeah. People define this mixing time for Yes, absolutely. So all of these things have natural non-stationary analogs. All of the sort of Debruchian ergodicity coefficients, all of those things generalize in a natural way to non-stationary models. But they're, of course, they're even in some sense much harder to actually get a numerical or analytical handle on in a non-stationary context than in the stationary context. So here's an illustration of what I was just describing. We're interested in congestion at 5 p.m. And you can sort of see in this model, uh, I'm going to use exactly the same random numbers starting from 4.30 p.m. through to 5 p.m. I'll use exactly the same stream of random numbers in this simulation and in the second simulation down here. So I'm basically, as I go further back in time, I use new uh, independent random numbers as I move back in time. But for any given interval, let's say 4.30 p.m. to 5 p.m., from one simulation to the next, I'm using the same stream of common random numbers. I use new random numbers as I go back to the left, as I go earlier in time. And so what you can see in this context, what in these particular uh, trace simulations is that uh, there was a significant difference. You know, you think about flowing all of these uh, vehicles between 4.30 and 5 p.m. in this simulation, exactly the same vehicles are entering between 4.30 and 5 p.m. here, but now there's some new vehicles that, have, that were uh, added into the system that entered between 4 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. That creates this congestion effect that propagates through to additional congestion that's still present in the system at 5 p.m. Now I go back to 3.30 p.m. Uh, using now a new set of random numbers corresponding to the new arrivals that arrive between 3.30 p.m. and 4 p.m. And now I see that in this last simulation, that basically hasn't changed the congestion effects whatsoever at 5 p.m. Right? So what we have here is an instance of so-called backwards coupling. And what you're seeing is that at some point when you do these simulations, eventually you'll see that the 
uh, system dynamics at 5 p.m., the congestion effects at 5 p.m. are basically not being affected by going back any further back in time. So now you know, based on this simulation, that potentially you can just start the simulation at 4 p.m. So this is something that you can do in a large number of different contexts. So just almost at the end of the talk. There are algorithms like this that are available for non-stationary reflective brain in motion. And I think one nice way of thinking about these backward simulations, they're fairly expensive to do. Uh, you can do these backward simulations on stylized models. For example, reflected brown in motion as being non-stationary reflected brown in motion in which the drift and volatility of the RBM are potentially time of day dependent. Do a simulation of that very simple system. See when that system loses memory and then use that as an approximation to when a much more uh, granular a real world discrete event simulation would be done. So basically as a preconditioner, as a way of assessing uh, how a much more finely detailed simulation would actually get initialized. So how far back would you have to go with a much more detailed discrete event simulation? Use a simpler model uh, and simulations of that simpler model to basically make that assessment. All right, so what I hope I've convinced you of today is that uh, non-stationary models are important. Or I think they're going to get more and more important as we go forwards in time. We do have some interesting refined approximations that are available for slowly changing Markov chains. These are broadly applicable approx uh, approximations, at least for Markov systems that exhibit stability. And there also are uh, a opportunities for developing interesting numerical algorithms for these non-stationary models. Pretty much all of the numerics that we think about applying in the world of stationary Markov processes, there are corresponding interesting numerical questions to be answered and interesting uh, algorithmic designs to be considered in the world of non-stationary Markov models. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.